Hey, thank you so much for joining. I'm Joe Peterson. I'm the Vice President of Cloud and Security for Clarify 360 and also the Chief Analyst at Clear Tech Research. And I'm here today moderating uh, Security Angle for you. Shelly is on a well-deserved vacation with her family. And I've got an amazing guest to chat with today. I've got Mr. Chuck Brooks of Brooks Consulting. Hi, Chuck. How are you doing, Joe? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, great to be here. Um, well, we're excited to have you. So in case y'all don't know, Chuck is the president, obviously, of Brooks Consulting, and he has over 25 years experience in cybersecurity, emerging technologies, marketing, business development, government relations. Um, on the daily, Chuck helps Fortune 1000 clients, organizations, small businesses, and startups achieve their strategic goals and grow their market share. In case you don't know, Chuck is also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University, and he teaches courses on risk management, homeland security, cybersecurity, and he also designed a certificate course on blockchain technologies. Chuck, did I get it all? What else do you do to keep busy during the day? Uh, well, I do a lot of things. I travel a lot to conferences. I actually just came back from uh, UK Farnborough speaking at the Spacecom show on cybersecurity for space. And I've got another one coming up uh, in May uh, in Rome, which I'm co-chairing on global cybersecurity. And one, I think, in April in, at uh, called GSEC in Dubai. So I'm making the rounds there. And I uh, also uh, visiting Edward Homeland Security today. And I write for Forbes. And uh, I'm here with my dog now, uh, preparing to head for this interview. <laughs> Great. Uh, well... Hello to the dog. What's the dog's name? Yeti. He's a, we, we rescued him from China. He was uh, unfortunately going to be eaten. He was stolen from someone, I think. And, and he's been here for now. It's his third year birthday with us yesterday. And uh, he's a great dog. He's an American Eskimo. Happy birthday, Yeti. <laughs> His ears perked. <laughs> oh, how cute. Um, so we are going to chat about cybersecurity, cybersecurity regulations. And what's kind of going on in that in that space right now? Um, so a little bit of a precursor. If we look back at 2023, we saw that Congress didn't pass a comprehensive privacy bill, but the White House pushed to implement a national strategy on cybersecurity. And at the state level, we saw moves to tighten data protection with lots of conversation around AI and its, its implications. So if we take a look through a legal security lens into 2024, we'll see legislative developments in a few areas. We're gonna see them, the regulation of privacy and data security, that's gonna be big. More civil litigation around data privacy, and then trends that pertain to government data collection. And let's go right out of the gate and talk about the EO on AI that came out in the US here in October 23. Um, the AI Act was also introduced in the EU in 2023, and there are huge differences between the two. Um, the legal team at DL Piper draws them out really nicely. So the EO draws on the powers of the presidency to require primary executive departments to formulate consensus industries and legis legislation for AI usage, which creates a risk of diversion standards. And then in contrast, the AI Act aims to establish a regulatory framework across the entire EU as a single regulation, which will be directly applicable in member states. So the EO predominantly focuses on standards and guidelines, whilst the AI Act enforces binding regulation violations of which will incur fines and other penalties for further legislative action. Um, so the question that I have for you, Chuck, is does the EO do enough? Well, it, it, it depends uh, from your perspective. I think first you have to clarify that, you know, there's there's a lot of cultural and historical reasons why they're different. I mean, Europe already is basing this off of GDPR, which they enacted a few years ago for, for privacy. So they followed some of the same formulas and they enacted it as, as one, one entity. Now, when you're dealing with the United States, we have a completely uh, divergent uh, uh, political system uh, based with lots of lobbyists and interests in industry that have 
uh, different viewpoints on what constitutes privacy and what constitutes data. So you're having uh, no real collective uh, agreement on, on what to enforce and what to find. So uh, the, the standards that are put forth from the U.S. Uh, Act, I think, sort of makes sense for two reasons. One is that, you know, we most people just don't understand what artificial intelligence is. We're too early and too uh, uh, uneducated to really formulate strong policies and enact them. And this is really, I think, a, almost a flyer to see what's going to happen. And, and creating standards is a really important area. Uh, it, there's been a lack of that in cybersecurity, as you know, a lack of that in the Internet of Things. And when you're dealing with manufacturers all over the world and you're dealing with uh, a global digital ecosystem, it's very difficult to to get on the same page with anything. So having some standards at least makes it uh, a goal worthy. But the second thing is that the, the act does draw attention to what artificial intelligence is and what may do. And I think uh, this kind of awareness is, is a really good thing for debate. Uh, there's all kinds of, of uh, thoughts on what AI is. And of course, you know, there's a doom and gloom crowd that says it's going to destroy us and take us over uh, relatively soon. <laughs> they, they, uh, a couple of people have predicted super into AI uh, by the end of the decade. So I think it's pretty interesting. But, uh, you know, when you're looking at, at trying to do any kind of enactment, you know, whether it be zero trust or uh, screen by design, really the toughest part is always getting the buy-in uh, from the private sector. And uh, for governments to to do this, it's a little different, of course, as I said earlier with, with, uh, with Europe where they have to follow and they also put stringent fines. We don't have that capability here yet. And uh, so I think we're going to see what has to happen to unfold and what the feedback is. You know, if you look at things right now, we're, you know, we're still, we talked about CMMC and defense for, you know, cybersecurity several years ago, but we still don't have an enactment yet. So our, our process is much slower and, and much more difficult to enact and, as, as a unified entity. So I think, uh, you know, so is it good as bad? It's good that we're talking about it. It's probably uh, remains to be seen whether it's really good or bad in its in its uh, directives. I'm glad you brought up CMMC because as you were chatting about this being a good first step, at least that's what I was hearing. Um, you know, the government sort of pushed the envelope with CMMC as it relates to ZTNA and said, "Look, if you want to do business with us, you got to have CM. You know, CMMC says you've got to have ZTNA in place." Are we going to see the government put a foot forward in your opinion to say, okay, well, if you're going to work with us on an AI project in any way, you've got to kind of have this framework in place. You think we'll see that same sort of thing? Yeah, I think we'll see it. But again, even with CMMC, it's not enacted yet. And there's a lot of issues because a lot of the small businesses can't afford uh, to have that expertise or pay for it. You know, so I think, uh, there's, there's a lot of, of divergence on what, what constitutes uh, the requirement. So uh, I think with artificial intelligence, uh, we're just beginning to understand the implications itself. You know, with generative AI, it's, is is quite, quite uh, unique in a lot of ways. And there's a lot of competing interests that use different uh, LLMs and other things. So uh, getting a grip on it is going to be difficult for the government. But I think the direction is exactly what you're saying. Uh, eventually, when this really, when, whenever it, it sort of starts to go out of control, uh, which mm -hmm. it may do, uh, there's going to be a call, a political call for for action, and I think there'll be uh, a next couple steps probably to to try and regulate it uh, more effectively, and that may include you know some stipulations similar to SEC, where if you don't do this in a certain amount of days, if you don't disclose it, or if you don't report to this entity uh, that you have uh, issued there, that you may have subject yourself to some sort of fine or, or penalty. So compliance is going to be a much tougher issue with, with AI, um, you know, than, than anything else, because it's not necessarily generated in the United States either. It can be from anywhere around the globe. So uh, just like cybersecurity. So it's, it's difficult to get a foot on. And so uh, we're still going to go as we go. And, uh, you know, I, I think if you're looking at Congress is the answer to things, you know, over the last few years, they've, they've demonstrated their ignorance of, of technology and, and of what is happening generally. And years ago, they, they voted to ban the Office of Technology Assessment because they thought they didn't need it. So I don't think we have the expertise legislatively. So again, I go back to our system. It's it's competing interests. Uh, you know, the, the big companies, small companies, medium companies, uh, various industries all have different perspectives. And to collectively get one uh, together is too difficult. That's why it's interesting to watch what uh, uh, with Zero Trust is uh, happening because that, that was sort of enacted 
uh, very uh, strongly uh, to get control of data and, and identity management. And it's really taken a, a, a foothold in, in, in all the various federal agencies by mandate, but now in the private sector. So I think that's maybe a good model to follow, but it, it'll take some time. Yeah, that's fair. And, you know, it's interesting as I see AI bubble up into the mainstream media, the thing that they talk about or that I hear them talk about at least is consumers are worried about their data, right? From that aspect, not, not so much as some of the other things, but the consumer data um, portion of things are you hearing the same? I'm hearing the same, you know, it's a, uh... Is, is again, is it is it sort of a dichotomy between uh, Europe and here? They're 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 yeah. very much concerned about privacy and data over there. Here, uh, you have a, a strong privacy group element, you know, that wants to protect data at all costs, and even identity, even even in cases of homeland security interests. But I think uh, most consumers are, are are ignorant of this. They 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 voluntarily uh, post too much or, or give whatever they want to give up without knowing it. I mean, the disclosures, of course, on the data. But I think uh, with the social media uh, algorithms now, it uh, uh, you know the it, the cat's already out of the bag. <laughs> you know, they know everything about us and what we do and where we shop, what we buy, and and what our interests are. And uh, you know, I, I don't see any regulation coming sit on that. No, but I you know it's interesting as I was preparing to chat with you, I was doing some reading about the state wide or the states that have adopted comprehensive data privacy legislation. And since 2018, 14 of them have done that. Um, five are currently effective and the remaining nine are going to go into effect between 24 and 26. Um, in your opinion, do we need national regulation on data privacy? I think we do. You know, uh, uh, you know, Vince Cerf, of course, the you know, chief evangelist for Google said there's not such thing as privacy anymore. But I, I think it's still uh, it's still the main uh, um, platform for for, for fraud, <laughs> and and particularly uh, victimizes the, the elderly and, and less informed people that, that use the internet. So it's it's going to grow, and they're not saying that the younger generations don't even care. They're, they'll 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 give anything. So so. It, if, unless it's federal, I, I don't think it's going to really be enforced. I think you know states are going to have a lot of challenges because again, this is this is a, a, a internet. This is you know where where is it you know where's the jurisdiction at, um, and who's going to enforce it? Who's going to give it? You know how much law enforcement activity you're going to really direct towards that with all the other issues going on? So I think it's good that states are considering it, and and, and, and they're all varying too. You know that that mm -hmm. hard law. So I think what what really is needed is a federal level. A law that is is consistent, uh, but maybe not necessarily strident in, in requiring every privacy because there's circumstances that that may negate a need for that. And again, looking for law enforcement and other issues. But uh, I think it's, it's it's a necessary goal at least to 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 go for because you know we're in a we're in a world now that is almost entirely digital, and uh, it's just starting to get it's bad already, but it's going to get much worse. Yeah, and you know. I was reading about this concept of data minimization and that some states are looking to impose obligations on the data controllers, like the organizations that maintain the data. Um, can you explain to us, in case folks aren't familiar, what is data minimization and what should every CISO be thinking about as it relates to data minimization? Yeah, it's, it's really a policy in a sense to really what data is available uh, to share. You know, uh, um, if you look at what you're looking at in terms of when you deal transactions and, and, and uh, mm -hmm. you're dealing with a lot of uh, vendors and stuff like that, they often have uh, disclaimers or they will say that your data will not be shared outside of this, you know. Whatever. So, so it's, it sets, it sets yeah. basically uh, posts where you can't, you can't do anything mm -hmm. with the data that's, that's not stipulated up front. So I think uh, you know the minimizing of, of where it can be shared is is really what it's about. But again, uh, the enforcement part of that is very difficult. You know, I mean, how do you track you know where everything's gone? You know, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of uh, services and stuff like that. But again, most people are unaware of it, and I'm sure all of us have experienced the fact that once we've we've uh, bought something on, on a, with a vendor, all of a sudden we'll get 50 different uh, advertisements from someone else. Our data sold, um, and uh, 
you know, selling the data is is a big issue too. And, and data aggregators are, are a big business. And as, as long as it's a profit for these companies and they're making huge profits on it, they're going to do all they can to try and dismiss any uh, efforts to really, uh, you know, lock down that data because that's a valuable commodity for them. It's like oil and, and data is valuable. And, uh, you know, for vendors and retailers particularly, uh, knowing the buyer beha- beha- habits and behaviors is, is like gold for them too. I mean, they, they, they need that uh, to, to basically streamline their, their industries uh, in that end. So I, th- I think, again, all this is really interesting. And I think it's, you know, all, you know, it's just like law itself. I mean, there's always, there's always gray areas. And, uh, you know, you, you have to really get a, a hand on, on uh, the global digital ecosystems before you can even try to enact a lot of this legislation. And then there's so many different components to, to prosecuting it and enforcing it and, uh, and also, you know, disclosing it. And, uh, you know, you, you, you're seeing, you know, it's, it's much easier in Europe, I think, to do that than it is here because we just don't have the mindset for it. Yeah, I, you're right. It is partly mindset. But, you know, I've, I've been thinking this whole time that data is bacon. But no, no, you upbold and told me that data is oil. <laughs> 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 um, I want to talk a minute about healthcare data. You know, um, there are states that are really being forward about what they're going to allow and what they won't allow. And in April of 23, Washington state's governor Jay Inslee signed the My Health, My Data Act into law. And it modified the legal landscape with respect to health-related data for certain Washington industry, you know, entities. Um, the MHMDA creates this privacy regime focused on personal health data. Do you think we're going to see more states follow suit here? And if yes, what does that mean for healthcare CISOs that need to sort of adhere to these new laws? Well, they still have, uh, you know, the HIPAA laws already in place. And, uh, yeah. You know, so, uh, you know, it, how, you know, the, the, the data itself is valuable and it's a privacy issue. There's two things there. It's less valuable than it was. Mm. I think the bigger problem right now with the healthcare industry is the ransomware um, because uh, they're being forced to pay and uh, yeah. you know, patients and, and use. But uh, getting back to your question, I think uh, I think there'll be some moves to that. Um, Washington's not a really uh, example of a, of, a, of a, a typical state. You know, they're, they're, they're smaller. Uh, they're, they tend to be... Uh, more consumer oriented than other states. So I, I'm not sure there's not mm. much, you know, that, you know, that, that, uh, if it, it's going to be, uh, sort of replicated in other states, but I think it's a good idea. I mean, everyone, you know, uh, you know, we are, we are, and we're also, if you really want to get futuristic, we're going to look at, you know, our DNA and everything now it's being shipped. So it's, it's, uh, you know, it's just not just our health data. It's our very cells that, it, that is at risk. And I think we have to implement those kind of privacy, uh, legislation for the future because uh you know it, it is going to be um you know a big brother kind of situation um if we don't and uh and and, and also the the obviously the the i still think the cybersecurity risks is still a big problem you know that that doesn't necessarily pertain to the data privacy it, it pertains to the, di- the data security but um uh, you know uh you know i think there's a long way to go again again we, the, the hippo stuff is been around for a long time and, and there's compliance issues, enforcement issues, but you hear every day of data being leaked, uh, private data, and, and, and the consequences have not been that severe. Yeah, well, and yeah, that's true. Well, my last question, um, it's got a little bit of spice to it because it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's an opinion question. So, or at least part of it is the SEC adopted new cybersecurity disclosure rules yeah. for public companies um, and kind of changed the game a little bit, right? As it related to risk management strategy, government, um, sort of impactful for some organizations. Can you break that down for us? And then can you tell us um, how CISOs are feeling about it that you talk to? Yeah, it's a mixed bag from what I'm hearing. Uh, but yeah, it breaks down is that, you know, they have four days to disclose a breach, a material mm-hmm. breach. And, um, you know, that in itself is not a bad thing because there's been obviously legislation and, and court 
activity around uh, uh, that has put the CISO at risk, uh, you know, from from uh, 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 several cases actually recently. Mm-hmm. And so I think from CISO's perspective, um, most don't like the idea because it puts more liability on their their shoulders, mm-hmm. and it puts more responsibility. And there's some that say that you know they're they shouldn't be responsible. So it's the C-suite's uh, role to protect the you know, the corporate activities, uh, not the CISO shouldn't go to jail or be fined because of that. So uh, that's a separate issue. But, um, you know, the SEC value, I think, is that uh, too many companies have been very lenient on cybersecurity awareness. And part of this this legislation calls for cybersecurity awareness. They have to get the fundamentals down. Uh, the breach is just one part of it, but they have to as an expertise. What they got rid of was that requirement on the C-suite and the board that you have a cybersecurity expert. And uh, that was originally in the, in the legislation for mm-hmm. out, which I think was a bad thing. Cause mm-hmm. I, I still think for most C-suites, they just don't have a clue and, they, and nor should they necessarily have it because the cybersecurity uh, landscape is pretty complicated with all the different technologies and all the different levels of security required and all the compliance. And um, you know, it can't all be on the CISO's shoulders and you need people on the board who understand the implications and liabilities. And, and, and that needs to be, I think, that, that, that missing ingredient needs to be reenacted. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, um, the SEC is, again, just like everything else, it's, it's the first step. Uh, mm. And we'll see how, what happens in disclosures. I, I know several companies that were reluctant to disclose, particularly public ones, because it affects their stock price. You know, and, uh, you know, everything is always a bottom line with these corporations. And its security has always been... Second thought, you know, is a cost item. But now I think what it does is it puts security up front. And anytime you have security up front is a good thing. So I think what we need to do is go back to this and look at how do we make this more functional and how do we really make it more fair? And it's, it's uh, you know, it should be really looked at also to protect uh, consumers and protect the small and medium businesses too that don't have an understanding of, of, uh, of what cybersecurity is or the resources or, or the expertise to, to really uh, adhere to this. But public companies have no excuse anymore, right? <laughs> they need to know. Yeah. yeah, they need to know. I, I, you know, what I'm hearing on the fairness aspect is, and maybe even a rethinking on some, on, par, on, par, on the part of some of the CISOs that I talk to, some of them feel as if, hey, look, if I'm reporting to the CIO and I ask for budget for this stuff and I don't get budget, how can I be held responsible, exactly. right? And it's, it's a fair question. And the, the second thing that I'm hearing them talk about is, okay, let's maybe let's give myself a different title here. Yes. And so, yeah. And then and then all of a sudden, and then I, I forget whose feed it was today, but now there's insurance coming out, personal insurance coming out for CISOs for, for life. Had you seen anything around that? I've heard about it. Now, you know, I, I, that's a good thing, in my opinion, but you know, they need yeah. it. You know, I think yeah. just like anywhere else in the, in the C-suite, they need insurance. But you put a really good point there because they don't have, most CISOs don't have budget authority. Um, mm-hmm. They don't even have, half of them don't even have procurement authority. So if they want something, no. that's they get it. Um, and they're forced to sit there and deal with a lot of uh, clients and a lot of issues half the time. So having, having a CISO responsibility for a breach that something may have been a system that, after they came on, you know, which often is the case, there's there's always lateral movement in these things, and and you're going against state actors too as a company. Uh, most of these are instituted by state actors or, or or supported by state actors. These groups, particularly the ransomware groups. So, how do you hold an individual that doesn't have the resources or capabilities responsible for fines? That part is wrong. You know, I think it's wrong. Disclosing a breach is a different thing. You know, obviously yeah. that's a good thing. Awareness is another thing, but holding liability to a CISO, I think, is the wrong way to go. Yeah, I do too. Um, yeah. So, well, thank you for taking some time with me today. Thank you for sort of, you know, sharing your thoughts on some of these upcoming and or existing legislations that we're seeing happen. It feels like we're at the start of some of the stuff for AI that we've, but we're just sort of peeling back the onion a little bit. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next few months. And we'd love to have you back and have you visit oh, with us to. again. Yeah. I've been seeing a lot now with the, the chief digital officer is now chief digital and artificial intelligence officer. In right. a lot of federal agencies. So it's, it's interesting. It's, they're, they're starting. 
But they're uh, starting. We're at the very beginning of the finish. You know, the finish line is a long way off. <laughs> oh, for sure. We're just all learning about it. So thank, thank you. you again for taking time. Yeah, Thanks, everybody, pleasure. for joining. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye.